Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection. Today, we've got a very interesting presentation by dear Lucy. Now, I want to tell you something about Lucy, but let me tell you what this very complicated topic is. Why does dementia sometimes cause hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia? And Lucy has a lot to say about that, and she's going to clear up the difference between those things for you, I know, because she always does. So let me tell you a little bit about Lucy, in case this is your first time hearing her. Lucy Barilak received her master's degree in social work from McGill University and has dedicated her career to supporting caregivers. Lucy was the founder for and long-term manager of the Caregiver Support Center at a respite program for family caregivers. There, she oversaw multidisciplinary training across caregiving, mental health, elder abuse, and palliative care. In 2003 and 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Award, presented by the Canadian Home Care Association, awarded for her dedication in developing a national coalition to support caregivers. Ms. Berlock also co-edited a book for healthcare professionals responding creatively to the needs of caregivers. And she's been a key architect of screening and assessment tools of family caregivers for professionals across North America. Lucy consults for private industry, including WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. Additionally, Lucy is a liaison supervisor at the School of Social Work at McGill University, where she currently supervises just a few in 20 interns. <laughs> Lucy, <laughs> you, you look so wide awake for all that work. And welcome. We're so happy you're here today. Thank you so much, Evelyn, and thank you. Minerva is going to help me with my slides today. I just want to let everybody know it's going to be a little bit different. Most of the session I will be talking just to sort of not sort of break the momentum, but certainly you can ask questions in the chat. I will stay an additionally half hour after the session is over, and we're going to close the recording so that you can ask any questions or share information or things that you've been uh, going through. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. Let's look at what the agenda is going to be for today. So I will be looking a little bit about dementia again, just to give us a bit of a review. I will be speaking about what are hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. I will touch slightly on Lewy body dementia because it does have a, a correlation with, uh, with delusions and hallucinations. And as well, I'll give you some tips on how to handle the behavior. And I will also speak about delirium because delirium sometimes gets very confused with dementia. And obviously, how can we prevent this? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So we're going to talk about, I want to just review a bit about um, dementia. You know, a person with dementia may be unable to put bits of information and memories together correctly, which can lead them to draw false conclusions and believe something that isn't true. It's more likely that a person will have delusions over time as their dementia gets worse. Delusions are more common in dementia with Lewy bodies and can affect people with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, particularly in the later stages. They are less common in people with frontal temporal dementia. So let's look at what is dementia, the loss of cognitive functioning, thinking, remembering, reasoning, to such an extent that it interferes with a person's daily life and activities. And you know, some people with dementia cannot control their emotions. They can get angry, they can get upset. And many times their personalities may change as well. You know, people who are very laid back can all of a sudden become aggressive, aggressive and vice versa. Next, please. Okay, so let's look at the possible causes um, of dementia. Dementia reduces the brain's ability to interpret and understand information. So the whole idea of sensory issues such as poor eyesight or poor hearing can affect it. There is reduced um, or no memory of recent events. They forget things, believe that things disappear, does not understand certain conversations, 
confused from forgetting to use a hearing aid of glasses. I'm really going to talk a lot about this because sometimes we just, it's just easier not to put them on, but it's so important. Now, other causes can be there could be side effects of medications, psychiatric illnesses from the past, unfamiliar environment, a low lighting that reduces vision and background noises. I will go into a little bit more details as we get uh, a little deeper into the discussion today. Next, please. I get a lot of um, emails and letters from uh, caregivers. I wanted to share some with you and maybe it relates with you and you can see some of the behavior and the people that you're caring for. So it says, Dear Lucy, my parents are both in their late 80s and dad is caring for mom who has Alzheimer's for the past few years. On my last visit, mom was very agitated and was not herself. She was pacing up and down the living room and refused to sit down on the sofa. I asked her what was the problem and she said that the cat was sitting on the couch. My parents do not have a cat and there certainly was no cat sitting on the couch. I tried to tell her that there was no cat, but that made her even more agitated and upset. It took a long time for her to finally go and lie down in her bedroom. What is happening to her and what should we do? As she signed it, sincerely, Isabel. Let's look at the next letter. Dear Lucy, in the past few weeks, my mother who lives with me and my husband has started behaving very strangely. Mom has dementia, but recently she's been talking to someone who's not there. It appears she's actually having a conversation with this invisible person. She looked very happy, smiling, and having a good time. I asked her who she's talking to. She said, Joe, down the street. I was shocked because mom was forgetful, but never did this before. I told her that no one was in the house, but she got very upset with me and told me that I don't know anything. Did I say something wrong? What should I do? And the last letter. <clears throat> Dear Lucy, my husband was diagnosed with dementia four years ago. I'm his main caregiver and truly love this man very much. It, it is uh, becoming very difficult for me in the past few months. Michael has started to accuse me of taking money from his wallet. He's not carried any money in his wallet for many years. I tried to explain to him um, that I never took any money and asked him to stop accusing me. He turns his head away and stops talking to me. This has been going on almost daily, and I'm very frustrated and don't know what to do. It's becoming very difficult, and I feel so lost and not knowing where this is coming from. Yesterday, he accused me of having an affair with the neighbor next door. Thank you for listening, Mabel. So maybe you can relate to these questions as well as think about your own experience, which we'll have an opportunity to talk to. So these are just a few examples of what happens when people do have hallucinations and have delusions. Next, please. All right, so what are hallucinations, delusions, and paranoias? People with dementia may experience hallucination, delusions, and or paranoia. So what is really important is to understand the difference between these that can help you as well as the person you're caring for. And I hope that this is what I'll be able to do today for you. But the other thing is understanding why this happens and how to manage it is actually crucial. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to focus now on hallucinations. And you don't have to jot this down because at the end, if you're registered with us, you'll receive all my uh, slides. Okay, so a hallucination is a false sensory perception of objects or events, including include uh, individual with dementia may actually see, hear, smell, taste, or feel something that's not there in reality. But remember, it is in their reality. For example, could include insects crawling on them or hearing people talk and thus responding to these voices. Tasting things that aren't there, for example, a metallic taste in their mouth, and smelling things that aren't there, for example, they can either smell smoke or perfume or even food that you're giving to them that they always enjoy and they say, oh, that smells horrible, because that's what they're actually smelling. 
Next, please. Okay, so what are delusions? Okay, a delusion is a false idea or belief, okay? This can sometimes come from misinterpreting a situation. You're talking to them, but they really don't understand what they're saying. So they, you know, their their mind goes somewhere else. Example could include a person with dementia thinking a family member is stealing from them or that the police is following them. But I have to say, as I'm going to repeat this over and over, this is really, they really actually feel that very much. Next, please. Now, paranoia. What is paranoia? It's a kind of delusion, suspicion. They kind of go together. For example, accusing a caregiver of being unfaithful. I have to say that this really happens a lot where spouses or partners accuse the other person of having an affair uh, or being uh, disloyal. You know, delusions are more common in dementia with Lewy bodies and can affect people with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, particularly in the later stages. They are less common in people with frontal temporal dementia. Next, please. So that's why I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about Lewy body. So just to kind of sensitize us to that, what it is. So Lewy body is not an Alzheimer's disease. Lewy body is difficult to diagnose. Medications in Lewy body can have adverse interactions. Medications are really so, so difficult to, uh, uh, you know, we take them for certain reasons, but then they have all these amazing side effects. You have to be very careful. Now, Parkinson's disease and Lewy body are very similar. So that's why it's so difficult many times to have a good diagnosis. Now, Lewy body affects sleep qual uh, quality. That's one of the big ones. Like most dementias, Lewy body is unpredictable. Now, um, you know, I just want to also remind everybody that dementia is the umbrella term that describes many kinds of dementia, including Alzheimer's. Lewy body is just another type of dementia. Because Lewy body is particularly affected by hallucination, delusions, and paranoia. So um, it is important to get a really, really good diagnosis about what's uh, what's happening with you because there's so many things that could come into play. And, you know, sometimes caregivers say to me, you know, I'm not quite sure if I got a right diagnosis, but I don't want to go to a doctor. I don't want to upset the doctor, but I believe in getting second opinions. If you're really not sure of what's going on, it's okay to tell your doctor um, to be, you know, to say, I really would like another uh, uh, opinion. And many times, you know, doctors will say, go ahead and do that. And I think they, you know, so don't be, don't, don't be afraid of doing that. All right. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So what do caregivers need to do? Okay. The most important thing that I want to tell you is that you really, really need to assess the situation. It's important that re to remember that hallucinations and delusions may or are not be upsetting the person living with the dementia. Remember that uh, daughter who was upset about her mother talking to someone, but the mother was very happy. She seemed to be okay with it. Not all hallucinations are frightening and not all delusions are paranoid in nature. Sometimes they may be the result of a person trying to make sense of things. For example, the person may not have remembered putting her purse away and concludes that it must have been stolen. When helping someone who is experiencing hallucination or delusion, the best way to start is by arranging a consultation with a person's doctor. The physician can look for physical causes such as kidney or bladder infections. Dehydration is huge in seniors. We don't drink enough water and sometimes medication causes that as well. There could also be pain or alcohol or drug abuse, all of which can cause hallucinations and delusions. It's also possible that medications being prescribed for pain are the cause. If the physician prescribes a medication, watch for and report any side effects you notice, including over-sedation 
increased, um, um, you know, increased confusion, tremors, or even tics. Even over-the-counter medication can cause someone to hallucinate, become paranoid, or be delusional. So you might please buying any over-the-counter medication, make sure you speak to the pharmacist first or to the doctor. Now, the other thing that I want to say, it may also be helpful to have the person's eyesight or hearing checked. This should be uh, checked regularly. Make sure the person's wearing their hearing aids and glasses at all times and make sure their glasses are clean as I had to clean my glasses before I started. It is very important. The other thing is, look how is the person responding to the hallucination and delusion. If they don't cause problems for the person, it's typically best to ignore them. It's also important to avoid arguing with the person about what he or she sees um, or hears. It's a natural reaction to try to correct the person, but unless the behavior becomes dangerous, you might not need to intervene leave them alone if they are not upset. So let's look at what other things can caregivers do. Next slide, please. You know, I'm gonna give you a lot of tips, but I want you to keep in mind that you know you're the person you're caring for better than anyone does. Some tips work for some people and some don't, but it's good to kind of have a whole bunch of them to kind of see what works for you. But one thing that is very important is to offer reassurance. Reassuring the person with kind words and gentle touch. For example, you might want to say, and you see that they're frightened, don't worry, I'm here, I'll protect you, I'll take care of you, or I know you're worried, would you like me to hold your hand and walk with you for a little while? You know, gentle patting may turn the person's attention towards you and reduce the symptom. Also look for reasons or feelings behind the hallucination or delusion and try to find out what it means to the individual. For example, you might want to respond with, it sounds as if you're worried or I know this is frightening you. This way you are acknowledging their feelings and supporting them. Now remember dementia, there's all kinds of stages. They could be in the beginning stages and they're still be able to, um, to really feel and they want to feel that you are, re are reassuring them. Others may not respond. So these are the things that you really need to look for. Now, this one I use a lot, distraction and redirecting when uh, someone with dementia behaves in a certain way that's difficult. It's a really good skill to learn. Suggest that the person come with you on a walk or sit next to you in another room. You know, just taking the person to another room, even to the kitchen, offering them a cup of uh, tea or coffee kind of distracts them and that hallucination may disappear. You know, frightening hallucination and delusions often subside in well-lit areas where other people are uh, or not. So if you're at home, and it's happening, but you see that the lights aren't on, maybe you should put some lights on or go over to the window, open up the blinds and have the person have a chance to have some more light. You might also try to turn the person's attention to a favorite activity, such as listening to music, singing along, drawing, looking at photo albums, anything that works for them, because that's the purpose of all of that. They might distract them, they will forget. Um, but this is also extremely, extremely important is respond honestly. Keep in mind that the person may sometimes ask you about the hallucination or delusion. For example, if he or she asked, you see him, you may want to answer with, I know that you see something, but I don't see it. This way you're not denying what the person sees or hears but you avoid getting involved in an argument. This response also helps to normalize the person's experience. Use this tip only if the person asks you the question, okay? 
Now we talk about modifying the environment and um, I'm talking about lighting and things like that. If the person looks at a kitchen curtain and sees a face because it's real to them, they see it. So remove it if you're able to remove it or change or close the curtain. Again, turn on more lights to reduce shadows that could look frightening. If the person insists that he or she sees a strange person in the mirror, it's possible that the person doesn't recognize his or, or, her, or her own reflection. So if the mirror doesn't have to be there, obviously in the bathroom, it's there. But if it's in the hallway, then take it down. If the person has delusions about people stealing from him or her, and if you can't find the thing right away, have some duplicates handy or put them in a place where you can actually show the person uh, that that object is uh, not lost and the object is there. So before I go any further, I'm just wondering if anybody does have a question or anybody wants to ask, uh, have a tip. So folks, if you're online on Zoom, please, you can unmute yourself. You can um, go to the chat room. You can put your hand up. I have a little website where I can see that. If you're on the phone, you can press star six and I can also see that and would love to call on you. And it looks like Christine Myers has her yes. line. Good morning. <laughs> so Good this morning. is all this is all new to me because um, my mother has not been diagnosed with dementia yet, but she's got this, you know, the symptoms. And I'm just waiting for the physician to call me for an appointment. So my because my, my mother is hearing impaired. And I don't know when we go to this appointment, am I supposed to tell her what it's for? Because they're going to test her for memory loss. And then what would be the next action if she is diagnosed? Because my, my father is taking care of her now. Um, so I'm just trying to find the best way to approach it because eventually my parents will be living with us. You know, my I'm getting my mindset there. It's, it's scary. <laughs> so do I tell her that it's a memory loss appointment she's going to? Because I don't want her to be yeah. combative or, you know, upset. I don't want her to be upset because I've right. learned not to argue with her anymore. You know, right. if she does if she doesn't remember, she doesn't remember. You know, right. it is what it is. Well, let me say that I usually don't like to um, fib about things. You know, right. I think honest is always. But the reality is she's going for a checkup. She, you don't know yet what's going on. So I would feel very comfortable if you just said that you're going to the doctor just to make sure that everything is okay, okay. and see what actually happens. Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable with that, but I don't, I, I don't yeah. like to create things that aren't there just yet. Okay. Right. I also want to say that I was a caregiver for my mother for over 10 years. So many of the things that um, we're talking about, I've experienced as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember having to take her to the doctor the first time. I didn't say what it, that it was for memory. Right. And I didn't know. So I think I would leave it alone. And once it's diagnosed, we can talk about it in the half hour. If you want to stay yes. on after the session, I'd be more than happy to go. Yes, into definitely. Thank I appreciate you it. Question. Thank you. Does she have a hearing aid? No, no, she's a, uh, because both of my parents are hearing, uh, hearing impaired. My dad's 84. He was born deaf and my mom's 80. So she lost her hearing as a child, but no hearing aids because she's completely deaf. So we, we translate, you know, we use sign language. So, okay. Does the doctor have, does the doctor know sign language? Or? Oh, what, what the doctors have to do. It's a, a law, uh, the Disabilities Act that they hire an interpreter. Okay. Yes. And okay. I prefer interpreters. Because my mother will, you. she will frustrate me. <laughs> right. right. Yes. Thank you for that. That's of an course. important thing. That's a good tip for others that uh, there is that option. Yes. And oh, it's a right. law. It's a law. They have to hire an interpreter. Okay, Lucy, we have a chat. And thank you so much, sure. Christine. Um, I have found, this is from Thomas. And let's see, I just lost it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. All right. I have found the more you communicate with your loved one about these things, the easier it is as it progresses. I understand not all families are that open with each other, but in the end, it is better. We have found great neurologists at UT Health, and most of them we have encountered have dealt personally with dementia in their own families. 
Thank you so much for that. You're right. And the tips that I'm giving you is, as I said, I'm going to be giving you lots of tips. And you have to decide, knowing the person you're caring for, what they would be comfortable and what you would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, let's talk about medication. This is huge. I can't, you know, I do a session on medications because um, I don't think a lot of people realize what good, but what harm medication can actually do. You know, research, research tells us that non-medical interventions are best. Interventions that are not medical in nature are often the best ways to help someone experience hallucination delusions. That's exactly what I'm talking about. All the tips I'm giving you are non-medical uh, uh, interventions. However, while non-drug interventions are often effective, medications can be helpful in some cases when the person is persistently upset by the symptoms and non-drug approaches have already been tried. You may also want to ask the doctor to evaluate the person to determine if medication needs to be added or adjusted to reduce hallucination or delusion. If the person has a history of serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, the hallucination or delusion may be related to that illness. It's important to work closely with the person's doctor to help determine an appropriate course of action. That's why I said to you in the beginning, the first thing you need to do is to take that person to the doctor because the hallucination could really be medical uh, that you're not even aware of and it could very well be the medications that they're on. So if we can go to the next slide, please. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna give you lots of tips um, and you have to kind of, gauge what's best for the person you're caring for. So encourage them to talk through their thoughts if they're able to do that, if there's the beginning or the middle aspect of whatever dementia they're going through. It may reveal what is behind their delusions. For example, if they don't believe their home is their home, there may be a reason for that. You might be surprised you decided to change the couch and it looks better. But to them, they don't know where they are. Or maybe unfamiliar people are coming. You may have uh, hired someone to help you at home. Or there's a plumber or an electrician came in for whatever reason. So find that out first, you know, um, and, and, and tell them that this person is there just for uh, a short period. Explain. The other thing is acknowledge their distress and how they must be feeling. Could you imagine if you were upset about someone and somebody wasn't acknowledging how you're feeling or telling you, never mind, that's not even important. Dismissing their concerns or trying to distract them without acknowledging their concerns first can cause um, this situation to escalate and cause them to lose trust in you. For example, if um, the person thinks that you're stealing from them, you know, Listen to them. Don't right away say, no, what are you talking about? I would never do that. Just acknowledge that you they must be feeling and suggest supporting them to find the missing object. Uh, gently suggest another activity, as I said before, which may distract the person and cause them to forget their delusion. Try to gently offer an, alter an alternative explanation for what may have happened and present this as another possibility alongside their delusion rather than opposing views. Reassure them that their concerns are being taken seriously. That's so important. If the delusion is ongoing and causing significant problems, try ways to avoid further distress, for example, if they believe that, um, you know, you might have a friend that's helping you out with cooking and they're bringing in the food, but the person you're caring for really feels that they're poisoning them. So obviously explain it to the friend and tell them thank you and find another alternative if you have a difficult time with cooking. There is delivery services, there's all kinds of frozen meals, whatever it is. So that's why it's important to kind of understand what is going on there. And um, again, most importantly, don't take it personally. How hard is that to do? That's really difficult, I have to say. You know, 
The person may make accusations against people around them, including their family, their friends, and you. The most common accusation is that others are trying to steal from them or harm them. They may also accuse their spouse of being unfaithful or of being an imposter. They just don't recognize. Being falsely accused can obviously be distressing. This is not easy to do. You need a lot of patience. And remember, this is the disease that is causing the behavior, not the person. That's why it's so important to always go back and recognize that this person is suffering from a form of dementia. So let's look at prevention is key. Next slide, please. Yeah. Again, how... Um, well, let's just go over this a little bit further. How a caregiver can deal with accusations. Again, don't take it personally. Please, please, please don't argue. Try to find the reasons behind the accusation. Reassure them without asking too many questions. Keep, you know, keep spare items around and always try and, um, you know, switch the focus. Next, please. You know, prevention is key. What is very important to keep in mind is that you are not alone in this. Many caregivers are going through the same difficult situation. There are a lot of resources in the community to support you and help you cope. Caregiving in general is very stressful and rewarding, I have to say. However, if the person displays behavior, I have hallucination, delusion, or paranoid behavior, it's overwhelming. It's important to let family members and close friends know what you're going through. Don't do this. You don't need to do this alone. Now, so the prevention, the key, as I was saying, first and foremost, make an appointment with the doctor. If behaviors happen frequently, there could be a trigger that's not obvious. So it's important to kind of figure that one out. Uh, it's important to figure out what could be causing or triggering the behavior. This is a good one. Keep notes or keep a dimensional journal. This may help you discover certain patterns or triggers. And I have to say, I did that for my mom and it really helped because the, I knew that at certain times of the day, things are going to go a little bit haywire. Mm -hmm. um, that certain behaviors happen in certain times of the day. It could be before or after meals. Uh, it could be related to a physical or emotional need, such as using the bathroom or being in pain. They could be tired, scared, angry, anxious. So if it's a certain time of the day, you could say to them, do you need to go to the bathroom? Would you like to lie down? Would you like a glass of water? Whatever it is. And one of the other things that we've noticed through research, I have to say, this comes up a lot. Any change in a daily routine can escalate that behavior one way or another. So before we go any further, are there any questions? You can put your hand up, use the chat room, unmute yourself, or press star six if you're on the phone. We'd love to hear from you. Well, that's okay. We can go to the next slide. Keep all your questions for if you're going to stay with us in the, uh, uh, the half hour after. Okay, hey, so why am I talking? Sorry. Lucy, I wanted to also say that one of the things that I noticed in early Alzheimer's, for those of you who are, you know, at the beginning of the journey, is, you know, people lose their executive function. And one of the other things that happens is we try to rationalize with them. And it, it just, it doesn't work because they can't think rationally line in a linear fashion. So trying to rationalize to say, well, where's the cat? I don't see the cat. Pick them up and bring them to me. You can't, you know, that's one of the things that you're telling them, you know, is the tip is, you know, don't try to tell them they're wrong. Don't try to tell them how it really works, but use the tips that you're giving them. Well, this is true. And that's why I started off with talking about dementia. Mm -hmm. I tried to kind of bring that to the forefront that their rationale and their way of thinking is nowhere near what yours is. And that to also keep in mind that for them, it's real. It's very real to them. If they see something, it's there. So the thing is to acknowledge it, to really get in to see how are they feeling about things and to um, be able to find out what the reasons behind it. 
It's not an easy journey, ladies and gentlemen. It's not. And patience is key. And um, it's, it's a process. As you're going along, you're learning with them. And by, you know, by, by uh, coming and listening to all these wonderful sessions that we have at the teleconnection really is an education that very much helps. So if there is no other comments, is there yeah, a Thomas comment? Had, Thomas had a couple. Um, yes, he says, we try to keep a regular daily schedule. Truly helps. We uh, walk after breakfast, run errands together, and then we play games in the afternoon. Um, and he also said, I found the more you communicate with your loved one about these things, the easier it is to, as it progresses. I understand not all families are that open with each other. Uh, we have found great neural. I think I already read that one. I work for UT Health. This is from Belinda. Uh, she's asking, did you go to Houston or San Antonio? And I think she's talking about UT Health. Can you tell me what doctors so I can reach out for my mom? And Thomas says, we are in San Antonio. Dr. Ereskin at the MARC uh, 8300 Floyd Curl. Thank you for that. You see, that's what these sessions are all about. It's sharing and with each other. And it's not just about me telling you what needs to be done. It's about uh, your experiences and how you can share it with other caregivers. That's great. Thank you so much for that. So you're wondering why is she all of a sudden talking when your person is in hospital? There's a good reason for that. <laughs> You know, when somebody lands in hospital, we focus on the medical emergency that brought us there, whether it's you or the person you're caring for. And then we need to navigate this to challenging healthcare system. We are busy advocating for care. We may not realize there is another risk to watch for. And that's what I want to bring up today. And that's delirium. Now, I'm, why am I talking about this? Because delirium sometimes really looks like dementia, but delirium is a medical emergency, okay? I'm going to say it over and over. Delirium can be treated. Delirium can pass, all right? So let's go to the, um, to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about delirium because you know, this happened and it happened personally to a friend of mine. I'm going to tell you about that in a little while. It's very scary. Delirium is sudden. Keep that word in mind. Change in how someone thinks, acts, or understands what's happening to them. They may be confused, see things that aren't there, or seem quiet, withdrawn, or sleepy. They could also be anxious, restless, agitated, or angry. Sounds familiar? It can sound like someone is having a hallucination, but the word for delirium, it's sudden. Delirium is very common and often affects older people while they're in a hospital or a long-term care home. It's also common in people living with progressive life-limiting illnesses, so you could have any kind of disease, so you need to be aware of that. But delirium can be overlooked because it can look like other illnesses. For example, delirium is often confused with dementia and depression. Next slide, please. So keep these facts in mind. I also want to say that delirium can affect anyone, not only those with dementia, um, did you know that up to three out of four older uh, adult cases experience delirium after a surgery? Okay, so they're always saying that things can happen, you know, especially when you have anesthetic. So I wanted it to look at, uh, is your family or you, are you at risk for the delirium if you're 65 years and older or 60 years old? So obviously the risk factors as being 65, I'll say 60 years old uh, and frail, already have problems with memory or understanding or already have dementia. You had a hip uh, fracture, you had some sort of a surgery, have a serious illness that's getting worse or at risk of getting worse. It could be diabetes or any heart condition have a significant alcohol or substance abuse, have poor hearing or vision. Okay, we go back to this hearing and vision business, very important. Take multiple medications, 
Remember, we talked about it, even over the counter medication. So if you have a cold, you go and get something for your runny nose, ask the pharmacist and the doctor before you touch anything. Have already had delirium in the past. That's another um, risk factor. Can we go to the next slide, please? You know, so here are some problems that can cause delirium. The person or you have pain. Remember, I told you it's a medical condition. You have an infection that you're not aware of. But believe it or not, it's also poor nutrition. What do I mean by that? It's not eating the right foods. Uh, it doesn't only mean not eating junk. It's just meaning not getting the vegetables, the protein, the fiber, the nutrition that you need. Now, dehydration is huge. Um, if for someone to get delirium, and, and we know that seniors don't um, um, drink enough, and because you take so many medications, it takes a long time to exit the system. So dehydration sets in. Constipation or urinary retention, even that in itself, you can't seem to empty your bladder um, or your stools. Low levels of blood, uh, blood oxygen, a change in medication, here we go again. Remember I told you, any new medications, ask the doctor or the pharmacist, what could be the side effects? Low salt or blood sugar levels, an unfamiliar or disorienting environment. Back again to the environment. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at that very quickly. What are the symptoms of delirium? You could be easily distracted, less aware of where they are or what time it is. They're disoriented, seem drowsy, depressed, suddenly not able to do something. For example, like walking or eating, unable to speak clearly or follow a conversation, have a sudden swing in mood, anger, agitation, hallucinate, seeing bugs or having a burning feeling, I don't know why my battery is low, even though it's hooked up. <laughs> Hold on. Um, have delusion or become paranoid, strongly believing things that are not true. For example, that others are trying to physically harm them, poison them, whatever. People can have more than one symptom of delirium at a time, and this can come um, during the day. The sign and symptoms are different for everyone. Just hold on for a second. Let me just plug it in. Let's see what's happening now. I don't know why this is happening, but let's hope it, everything is okay. Let me tell you my own experience with a friend of mine that I had with delirium. My friend just retired at the age of 60. She worked in a healthcare system. She was very alert and, dis and oriented, but she suffered from, um, she had cancer and she was on treatment uh, for her symptom and she landed up in hospital. I would go in every day to visit her just to see how she's doing, what's happening. Um, one day I was coming from work and I was holding my agenda. I still have agenda. I don't put everything in my phone. I'm old fashioned, I guess, old school in that way. I walked in and um, I said, hi, how are you doing? And she said to me, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to visit you. <laughs> Is there any? And I brought her some little goodies and I said, here, I brought you something. And she said to me, you came to spy on me, didn't you? I really thought that she was joking with me. I said, spy on you? No, not really. Can't you see how you are? She started to yell at me and told me to get out of her room. She didn't want to see me and to never come back. I was so taken aback. I went into the hall and I started to cry hysterically. I mean, I didn't know what happened to my friend. Anyways, we decided that the family, we wanted a case conference with the doctors. And the first thing they said, well, maybe she's getting dementia. She's not getting dementia. This is not dementia. I looked it up at the time, many years before I even did this program, and we suggested that maybe it was delirium, and it was. It took her a little bit of time to recuperate, but she did, and she was fully the same old Esther that she was before. So that's why it's really, really important to be aware of that. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm just looking at the, the time factor. So let's look a little bit about how is delirium different from dementia? 
Although difficult, uh, although different, they have similar symptoms such as confusion, agitation, delusion. It can be hard to tell, even for healthcare professionals. When a person with dementia also gets delirium, they will have symptoms for both conditions at once. There are important differences. Delirium starts suddenly. Remember the word suddenly? One or two days in symptoms often vary uh, a lot over the day. In contrast, symptoms of dementia come on slowly over months or even years. So it changes or symptoms start suddenly. This can be a red flag for delirium. Dementia with Lewy body is an exception. This type of dementia has many of the same symptoms as delirium, including visual hallucination, and they can vary a lot over the day. All right. So let's open it for questions. I think I think I saw somebody posted something. So let's take a little break because I really am telling you an awful lot. Okay. Belinda asked for help in um, unmuting. And let's see. I think Minerva, she just goes to the down to the bottom of the screen, right? Where there's a little mic. Yeah. Even that, you know, where there's a little microphone. Correct. Uh, if she has the screen on full down okay. at the bottom or towards the center. She's, she's open. Go ahead, Belinda. We want to hear from you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I had a question um, earlier when we were talking about the medications. Um, we, my sister and I were so hesitant only because the dementia runs in the family with my mother's uh, siblings. So what we've seen in them and how quickly it they declined and we were so worried. And usually, I think now I'm learning more and I'm a little bit open to the medications, um, but the, the people around... Uh, my aunts and my mother and stuff always tell us don't let them give them those meds you're gonna have them dozed off all day and sleepy and you know and and I guess that we were so worried my sister and I my mom is now living with me and um, I started thinking about it a lot and I told my sister you know this this has been very hard but um, I told her look I'm gonna be very observant and it's very hard because I, it's very hard to handle, right? So I told her, she's my little sister. And I told her, I'm not going to just send mom to you all the time. We work as a team. And I said, I'm not going to do that. You're my little sister. And I'm going to, and I look out for you. I said, but I'm going to handle as much as I can. And um, recently I did have to take her into the neurologist um, because I was worried about hurting her, hurting herself. Um, she started feeling bugs and I didn't know what, what it was at the beginning. I was like, mom, there's nothing there. You know, I'm checking your hair. I go through her hair. She would, um, she lives in my guest home and right behind our home. Uh, but we do have cameras set up and we have, you know, everything she needs there. Uh, because of course, you know, it's, it's me and my husband and, um, she sometimes does things right. Undresses herself and does things like that. So um, she's comfortable there. She's usually with me all day. I mostly work remote uh, with UT Health. And um, I said, I, I, I don't know, but I'm seeing that she's tugging on her hair. Mm -hmm. And because she had cancer, um, I noticed that at, she's in remission right now. Her hair actually started growing back. Um, so the lady that helps me once a week, she helps clean and she spends a little time with my mom. She says, there's a lot of hair. It's in the trash can. And I started noticing, well, in the cameras, I look and she troll it and she tug. <laughs> and I said, mom, what's going on? I think she was embarrassed to tell me she thought she had bugs, you know, lies in her hair. And I said, well, mom, let me check. Um, I couldn't see anything. She'd get up desperate washing everything. So I had to call the neurologist for the life of me, I, I couldn't just get an appointment. You know, he's busy. There's no time. Um, in the last session, I listened to the recording and they did, they did say it's important to get a, a diagnose, right? What is it? What is it that she has? Which type of dementia, which stage? And I, I said to him, I need her to get tested. So right now they're going through the insurance to see if they'll even cover that. She only has Medicare. I did apply for Medicaid. We're going through the long process right now to see if I can get help. 
because I've asked if I could just work remote 100% until I can try to find some help, you know, right. because I do have to work. I, I'm, you know, unfortunately I'm not rich. So I, I noticed these things. I I've been really worried. I did call the office. They had started her on a medication, very low dose. And what they told me is that I, they were going to increase it. I know that it's not a symptom from the medication because she started feeling this before she started the medication. You know, they had prescribed it um, because of the hallucinations, um, but we had trouble with the insurance. Uh, so finally, when they approved it, um, she already had been feeling the lies in her hair. I took her into her primary. I said, I'm not leaving here. Check her. Evaluate her. What is it? I can't be the only one telling her. There's nothing there, mom. I need, she trusts you. You're her doctor for years. I sat there. He looked at her head. He told her there's no bugs. It might be an irritation. I'm going to prescribe a shampoo. So since then, she grabs that shampoo and she just blots it on yeah. her hair. It seems like you, I'm sorry to, I, it's not that I want to interrupt you at all. I, I, what I want to say first and foremost, I'm so, so sorry what you are going through. And I can relate to what you're going through. And it, all the things that you're saying are so, um, so important. And the fact that you were able to tell your doctor, I would just like to know, what is your name, please? My name is Belinda. Melinda, well, do you have the time to stay on after we finish for a half an hour that I'm going to be closing the recording? I'd really like to talk to you a little bit more. But just to respond to the medication, um, I, I think it's, as I said in my presentation, I would prefer people using all the other tips without medications, but sometimes medications are extremely helpful. And it is very important to ask for all the side effects that are going on. So I'm hoping that you will stay on with us a little bit longer. Would that work for you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes. <laughs> it is so, it's so difficult to hear what caregivers are going through. I don't think anybody understands unless you are a caregiver um, of, and, and being and being a professional that I was and my expertise was with, with uh, caregiving, I still found myself many times in a position where I would say, gosh, Lucy, now you know what it's all about. You know, I walked in the shoes of a caregiver. I don't know what the next slide is, but maybe we can go to it because we're coming to the top of the hour. And I know Helen has, um, Evelyn has uh, things to say as well. So I guess what I want to say is that uh, delirium uh, is a diagnosis. It can certainly diagnose it. If you can go to the next slide, please, as long as the doctors realize there are treatments. Okay. Uh, and the first treatment is really to address the medical problem, because as I said to you, it's a medical problem. So once they kind of uh, know what it is, um, there could be uh, medications, I think one of the most important things with uh, delirium is to be able to really eat and drink regularly good nutritious food. It's also important to, there says that you need a calendar, 24 hour clock. It's keeping them in the moment and the present, having people that they know uh, be with them, um, helping them to process what they're going through, to keep them active if they can be mobilized, it does take sometimes even a few months to get out of a delirium, but you can get out of the delirium. If you have delirium dementia, that's a little bit more challenging. So with that, uh, if we go to the next question, um, there is the whole idea of prevention. So again, the prevention is pay attention to medical signs, eat well at all times, uh, keep people comfortable, Spend time, as one of the people on the chat said, spend a lot of time with the person you're caring for, talking to them, connecting. Make sure eyeglasses and earring aids and dentures are in good working um, a condition, plenty of sleep, um, and you know, keeping a good routine. With that, there's also, um, we have a resource file. 
And I'm going to leave it up to Evelyn because I know it's the top of the hour. Evelyn, I see something from Thomas, but it's really up to you. Well, I think people are looking for resources, which of course we are always <laughs> happy to give. The number one is for local resources, 211, for resources that you may want to get to your local area agency on aging, which has all of the resources and has caregiver specialists who actually work in their shop there. And there are 655 of them across the United States. So you certainly have one in your area somewhere. Um, and you can find them by going to uh, eldercare.acl.gov. That's the elder care locator. And I'm going to give you the phone number for them too. That's 800-677-1116. And it's great because during the week, they actually have a live person who puts in your zip code, which you would do online if you went online. And it gives all of the resources, you know, you can you can look and see what resources are in your area. So you can also call, um, in addition to your local area agency on aging, there's good old Minerva, who is an expert on just about everything in regards to caregivers. And I want to give you her phone number because she's going to send out the post-session questionnaire. And if you got this number or Zoom link from someone else, you really want to get the resources that are going to come with it, which Lucy showed you on the last page, and you won't get the resources unless you're registered. So either you can call Minerva or our customer service person who is Minerva um, at 866-390-6491. You will also, once you're registered, get the monthly calendar. Um, we ask that you do fill out the questionnaire. It really helps us keep improving our program. We have two sessions left this month. We have one on uh, the, the 18th, and that's managing the holidays, interactive discussion about how to cope. And, you know, holidays get so stressful with everybody wanting a piece of you and you're trying to divvy up the pieces of you in the right way. There's also on next Thursday, Creative Caregiving for Alzheimer's with Dr. Natalie Oliver, who's been, is a caregiver, has a dementia parent living with her. So she understands what you're going through too. And with that, I just wanna thank you all so much for being here today, for your great questions and comments. Um, I hope we got, you know, we answered most of you. Natalie, I love your cat picture. It looks just like me. Oh, no, the cat's better looking. <laughs> I wish you all happy holidays. And I wanna thank you for what you do every day. I also want to thank the Wellman Charitable Foundation for the incredible job that they do to support caregivers. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording because Lucy wants to make sure that, you know, the personal stuff that you talk about with her does not get recorded. So.